morning. Good morning. You can see on the screen some of our upcoming events, and we'll have Jim talk about the meeting that's going to happen today after church. We'll start us off. Thank you. 
Please stand as you are able and willing and join together in our call to worship. Praise God. Alleluia. Alleluia. We praise God of all creation. Peace. Salam. Shalom. We come praying for the peace for all the nations. We come with summit, steadfastness, in solidarity with our global siblings. We worship God, we follow Christ's call, and we follow the guidance of the Spirit. Let us worship the one God, source of all life, ground of all being. Alula, let's go. Let us worship God. You may be seated. Let us continue together with our opening prayer. God of all the nations, as we gather on this World Communion Sunday, we acknowledge that all is not right in the world. We long for peace in Palestine, Lebanon, Israel, Ukraine, Sudan, and all the places where there is violence in the world. We grieve our nation's own contributions to that violence. Help us to remain steadfast in our commitment to global justice and peace. Open our hearts to our siblings throughout the world, and open our hearts to your spirit. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray.
we have no shorter people here to uh, come up and, and listen to the story, but I just wanted to remind you where we are in this, in this uh, journey through the Older, Older Testament, the uh, Hebrew Scriptures. Um, because we're still talking about Moses today, and our scripture for the day, the adult scripture, skips over this story. So I thought I'd, uh, I'd just share with you and remind you. I used to be able to do the kindergarten thing and show you the picture while I was reading, but not since the bell's palsy. Just doesn't work anymore. So, the voice from the burning bush. When Moses grew into a man, he looked after his father-in-law's sheep and goats in the desert. One day he saw a bush burning, but to his amazement, the leaves were still green. His heart was pounding as he walked closer. Moses! Moses! God called out from the bush. Moses shook and covered his face with his hands. Here I am, he said. Take off your sandals. You are on holy ground. So Moses did as he was told. I am the God of your ancestors. I promised Abraham that I would watch over his family and give them a land flowing with milk and honey. I have heard the cries of the Hebrew people. Go to the Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Who am I that anyone should listen to me, Moses asked. Moses, I need you to be my lips, my ears, my eyes, my hands, so that I may free my children. Who will I say has sent me? Tell them I am who I am. Moses still trembled, so God said, Do not be afraid, my child. I will be with you. And the prayer is, Dear God, let me have the courage to do what you ask of me. You can all come up and look at it. It's always on this Our reading continues in Exodus 32, verses 1 through 14. Moses was an extremely long time in returning from the mountain, and when the people saw this, they turned to Aaron and said, Come and make a God for us. Someone will lead us. We don't know what has happened to that Moses who brought us up from the land of Egypt. Aaron replied, Remove the gold earrings you are wearing wives and husbands, sons and daughters alike, and bring them all to me. All the people brought their gold earrings to Aaron. Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and cast it in a mold, and made it into a calf, a young bull. Then the people said, Israel, here is your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before the idol, proclaiming, Tomorrow we will have a feast in honor of Yahweh. In the morning, the people rose early, sacrificing burnt offerings and bringing communion offerings. And then they sat down to eat and drink, and lost themselves in debauchery. Yahweh said to Moses, God, down now. These people whom you led out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. In such a short time, they have turned from the way that I have given them, and made themselves a molten calf. Then they worshipped it and sacrificed to it, saying, Israel, here is your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Yahweh then said to Moses, I look at these people, how stubborn they are. Now leave me to myself, so that my anger may pour out onto them and destroy them. But you I'll make into a great nation. Then Moses soothed the face of Yahweh his God. But why, my God, should you let your wrath pour out on these people, whom you delivered from Egypt with great might, with a strong hand? Why should the Egyptians say their God intended to destroy them all along, to kill them in the mountains, to erase them from the earth? Turn your back on your rage, reconsider it, 
the disaster you intended for your people. Do not forget Sarah and Abraham, Rebecca and Isaac, and Leah and Rachel and Jacob, your chosen ones, to whom you promised. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. I will give you all this land which I have promised. I will give it to your descendants, and they will enjoy its inherit inheritance forever. So Yahweh relented, and the disaster that threatened the Israelites was forestalled.
a couple different things come to mind. And so I'm going to just talk about one first and then the other. How's that? Um, so the first thing is I'm always fascinated by these passages where the human leader has to talk God out of the anger, right? Moses then soothed the face of Yahweh. Moses soothed the face of Yahweh. Yes, I know the people have messed up. Yes, I know that it might just feel like you want to wipe them off the face of the earth right now, God, but, but think about how far they've come. Think about what that says about you, God, if you would do that. This is not something I was taught was okay. Humans don't question God, right? We just don't. But there it is. Moses saying, wait, 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 wait a minute ago. Now, we all know this is all an imagining. This is all writing down an experience. And so, yeah, there are times when it feels to me like God is really angry, like God is ready for vengeance, like God is. And then what does grace feel like? Grace feels like answered prayers because grace is answered prayer, but grace is also the nature of God. And so we might really mess up in this world. We might really take things in a direction that have nothing to do with love and justice and compassion. <sighs> somehow, there is grace. And somehow, in that grace, we can find ourselves again. We can find who we're called to be as children of God, as people of the promise. So the other thing about this text comes from my experience yesterday um, and putting it all in perspective. So yesterday I went to Hazel Park United Church of Christ. We had a covenanting meeting. Um, and in this meeting, as you may or may not know, the Minnesota Conference of the United Church of Christ right now has an intentional interim conference minister. Our conference minister, Sherry Prestman, moved on to the national office and is doing fabulous work for our national office, but we are in a search process. So yesterday's meeting, they are having them all over the state, and yesterday's meeting was just to gather some of us to say, who might we need? Who are we as a United Church of Christ Minnesota Conference? Who might we need to lead us into the next phase of our journey? And so we had these conversations that sounded an awful like, lot like what I see happening in this story of the golden calf. And what I see happening in our nation. And what I see happening around the world. Because there is this balance always to be found in a community of people between caring for the people, nurturing the people, and empowering the people. And if you just don't get the balance right, you either have too many cooks in the kitchen, shall we say, right? Um, if you've ever worked in, in a church kitchen, you know that that can be, right? Anybody experienced that before? If everybody's got to say over everything, sometimes it can clash. On the other hand, 
One of the concerns I have had about the Christian Church, and especially the United Church of Christ, is that we have had this model that we have lived by. And pastors have been told, you are servant leaders. In fact, I was on a Zoom meeting uh, maybe six months ago, and the speaker said, my calling is to serve my people, to serve my congregation. And it just turned my insides inside out. Because my calling as your pastor is not to serve you. It is to serve God and to empower you to also serve God. So we've had decades of leadership in the church that got all into the servant thing. We've had decades of leaders who said, I am the shepherd of the sheep. And little by little, in some congregations, <laughs> in many Christians, the congregation has given over so much authority to the pastor. that they're waiting always, right? I'm not saying this is this congregation. I'm just saying that it is, uh, in some congregations, uh, there, I have had people who were raised in a, we used to call it the hair pastor congregation, right? Hair pastor, um, where the pastor was the authority over everything. And nothing happened without me being asked first. You know what? I had an opinion about chairs. That's your decision, right? The pastor doesn't need to be in charge of everything. And so you've got this group of people that has come out of slavery. Their whole life has been about being told what to do and when to do it, when to eat, what to, right? They just worked for somebody else. And Moses is taking them out of that situation and trying to lead them into something new. And he's gone for 30 days, 40 days, I guess. He was up on that mountain waiting for those Ten Commandments. And they're like, we don't know what to do. And so in that absence of power, in that absence of authority where they thought they were supposed to put their authority. They were clamoring after whatever authority they could find. Whatever authority, and so I, we see it throughout history. People are like, oh my gosh, things feel chaotic, things feel chaotic, and somebody comes in and says, I'm going to take you there. I will lead you. And the people say, oh, thank goodness we don't have to think anymore. Oh, thank goodness we don't have to make these decisions on our own. And it gets so easy for people to just follow. Whether that be a person called by God or whether that be one of those false prophets that we've been warned about. So I don't know where this takes us, except that I am feeling like whatever is next in the Christian church, and we had these conversations yesterday, that the church of the past is fading away in all denominations, right? People are just not finding in traditional church what they found before. So now is a time when everybody in the church has to be empowered to reclaim our own beliefs, to reclaim our own theologies, to, right? to be bold, to be bold about speaking what you believe into the world, 
because I personally believe that what we talk about in this place is of vital importance in the world around us. And we've been taught not to talk about our faith. We've been taught not to take authority, to hand that authority over. Now is the time. Now is the time to tell our rejected neighbors that you are not rejected by God. God does not think you are sinful. Now is the time for us to say, how can we work together to make this world a better place? And I have this one gift that I can contribute. Because not one of us can do it all. But I have this one gift that I can contribute. And I will offer that gift. And oh, by the way, your gift complements mine. And maybe together we could get this done. Maybe we could grow a community that's based on love. And then we spread that all throughout this world. And that doesn't mean we don't need to be cared for in this place. But we care for one another. Because somebody in here has a fabulous gift for just knowing exactly when somebody is not feeling quite right and needs a word, needs a hug, needs a handshake, needs attention. Somebody in this group is fabulous at feeding people. Somebody in this group is fabulous at making a party happen, right? And that's what's wonderful about this place. All those things can happen, and you don't have to wait for me. Just make them happen. And you don't have to wait for council. Just make them happen, right? So, your thoughts for today.
only one we hold in mind today. All those who will be rebuilding for years, who were in the path of the hurricane. May they know we hold you in the Lord. prayers for the children of the world, that the world would become a better place for them. All children, I hope you know, we hold you in the light of Christ. And we lift prayers this day, loving God, that the marginalized gender become more mainstream, more accepted, more understood, more welcomed. Please know, we hold you in the light of Christ. Continue prayers for the Bitings as well. We hold you in the light of Christ. There are other prayers to be raised from the congregation today. Parts of Dakota are on fire. Parts of Dakota are on fire, so we'll pray for those in the path of that. Mm -hmm. All of those in the path of fire's destruction, we hold you in the light of Christ. Just prayers of joy for the small little voices we're hearing today of Elsie singing along and Gideon back here. <laughs> uh, we are indeed grateful for all of the wee ones that join us, and so we hope they know we hold you in the light of Christ. God of love, God of majesty, God of such deep, deep grace, God of empowerment and encouragement, God of courageousness, you have heard the prayers we have offered this day. Hear us now as we pray a reimagined interpretation of the words Jesus taught us to pray. Great love. The root and sap of our evolving fullness, not just forward in our creative potential, so we may flourish for the common good. In each mindful moment, help us recognize that we free ourselves from the ghosts of our past. In the release, we grant those who have harmed us. Keep us focused on what is right. Make us thirsty for what is just, for it is love that knows the way, shows the way, becomes the way, to the fulfillment of our eternal call. Amen. Just as Moses took a group of people who had no confidence whatsoever and led them to a promised land where he was not allowed to go and they took it on and grew a great nation. Jesus took a group of 12 disciples and all of his followers and he said to them, greater things than this will you do if you do them in my name empowering his leaders. And so today, this Worldwide Communion Sunday, we are gathering at this table to remember, to empower one another, to challenge one another. 
because on that last night that Jesus was with his friends, he took that loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them and he said, take and eat all of you. Like my body will be broken, this bread is broken for you. And then he took a simple cup. And again he paused to offer a blessing. And then he gave it to them and he said, take and drink all of you. Just as this cup is poured out, my blood will be poured out for you, for all. And so I invite you from this day forward, whenever you eat this bread, whenever you drink this cup, remember me. So we call upon the spirit of the risen Christ to be with us at this table. This Christ's table where every, every, every person is welcome. That the Spirit would bless this bread, that the Spirit would bless this cup, and the Spirit would bless each and every person that comes to the table. That we might become the body of Christ for this time and for this place. So please come. We're all is prepared.
gracious and loving God, you have made us one in the body of Christ and nourished us at your table with holy food and drink. Now send us forth to be your people in the world. Grant us strength to persevere in resisting evil and to proclaim in all we say and do your good news in Christ Jesus our Savior. Amen.